Okay. I think we're live. Can everybody hear me? Right, so the idea behind this is to go, thank you, is to go through the very basics of what you need to do to have something 3D on screen. Um, not using any hardware, not graphics cards, not shaders, not anything like that, just what's the core mass to get something spinning and something visible on screen. Um, so for that, I'm using this uh, OpenGL uh, framework that I wrote a while ago. The link's in the description if you want to go and get it. It's up on GitHub. Um, it's got... I'll just have to take a quick minute to go through it. So it goes through and does the kind of basic screen setup and um, has a kind of render loop and, and whatnot there. So you can, you can do OpenGL stuff if you want. Uh, at some point, we might do another stream doing 3D with actual OpenGL. And things like font rendering, so you can draw stuff. Let me just run it and show you what's in there as, as a start. So the font's rendered with OpenGL, so they're all triangles. Each quad's a triangle. It's got weird button things. Um, and it's got some sprite rendering, line draw and stuff. Now, everything on this black square is a software screen. So this is an X by Y array of ints that is uploaded to a texture each frame and then drawn. Now what that gives me is the ability to do software rendering in OpenGL because um, software rendering is fun. And there's some tools that I've put in here, just usual stuff that um, I, I tend to use. So plot a point, draw a rectangle, fill a rectangle, draws a line. Um, does a circle actually an ellipse and draws a sprite, clip sprite. Um, so the, I mean, there's nothing terribly complicated in these. No rectangles, just a loop that does lots of plotting. The plot does kind of a clip. Um, line drawing is very simple. There's two sections to it. Um, if you've got a very tall line, I'm trying to see the thing like that. Then you're going to step down the way and have a fractional X. If you've got a very long line, then you step along the way, so one pixel at a time, and then a fraction going down. So here you can see if the X is bigger than the Y, just subtract those, then it gets a fraction of Y. It's all floating points, so there's nothing clever about it. Um, and then it just adds on and floors. So Y comes down in fractions, and then you get a nice line draw. It's very simple. Um, but that's what we're going to use to do our 3D stuff. Um, so we've got line, circle is just, you know, plots of circle. Again, it's not very complicated. If you did a big circle, there'd probably be spaces between it. Uh, really, you need to do lines between the segments, but um, it, it's just a debug thing, really. Uh, and that's just sprite, and that's doing clipping for sprites, and then draws a sprite. X and Y goes down and draws it all clipped. So this is pre pretty much what we're going to be using. And there is other stuff in here. There's file things that you can um, load a buffer and then you can read bytes, you can poke bytes, 16s and so on like that. So it lets you read stuff from binary files nicely. Um, the file system, load a file, it'll load a file. There's also one there for um, Android. So who knows? Um, some HTTP stuff. Just lots of utilities. Um, and then, like I say, some um, OpenGL stuff, including shaders, because you obviously need a shader of some description to do things these days. Um, so that's there as the core. Really, we're going to be concentrating on this section. Now, I did go through and get a lot of this working before. So I'll just show you quickly what we're going to be aiming to do. So, this is again the same thing. Yeah, it's the game, it's got the same OpenGL framework. If we draw this, this is what we get. We get a spinny elite spaceship. 
in 3D. And then a couple of cubes spinning. Now this is a hierarchical model. So you've got model there, then stuff sticking off it with their own rotations. We will cover that as well, because that's the basics. And it's actually all part and parcel of how it works. It's really simple. So that's what we're going to aim to do. And I'm going to be cutting and pasting between this. I'm not going to sit and type uh, stacks of lines of code when I've, I do have it just sitting there. But we'll do it in bits. So, um, I'll tell you what I did forget to open. Is the matrix thing. Now, all 3D that we do these days is done through matrices. Um, and before I do that, what I'm going to do is just quickly show you how I started. Now, this was a magazine. Has it got the date on it? There you go. July 1983. And I got this magazine from somebody. You can tell by the way, Cole, that somebody um, cut out something to order. There's a, an order form on the other side. This was on the Spectrum, written in BASIC to draw a tank. Um, just go through them. So it goes through the 3D stuff. Um, hello back from Scotland. I will try and remember to keep looking at the chat now and again. I do tend to get a bit fixated on what's on the screen. So I will try and glance at the chat now and again. So hello everybody that's here. Um, so 3D, you can see the axis, X, Y, Zs. Um, I suspect most of you know these days what basic 3D is. You might not just know how it works. So this um, magazine is actually up on my uh, blog. If you go on there and search for magazines, you'll, you will get images of this. So you can go and look at it later. Um, so each point has an XYZ coordinate. So um, you could have 1111 would put it kind of in the front. 111 minus 1 would put it deeper in on Z. And... So each cube, you can just imagine, you know, some of the coordinates, some of those ones changing to positive or negatives to give you a cube. And then you've got the different axis and then each one has an angle between 0 and 360 to do the rotation. So what we're going to uh, look at today is how you take a model that has a whole lot of X, Y, Z coordinates and put them through rotation and get them on screen. And we're going to draw them in wireframe. So... When I started, this is what I had. I didn't understand any of it. Um, I still don't really know how it works. It's all a bit magic. Um, but what you do have is the different angles for a different axis. So it doesn't really matter if you understand the actual maths. As long as you've got the code, you can kind of plug it in and see what you're doing. Um, so does it actually say what pi and stuff is? Gamma theta doesn't really, in this case, I think I just ended up plugging them in and go, that rotates that axis, that rotates this axis. It probably tells you somewhere that it's, um, what each of these pi, theta, and size are, but I'm not seeing it anywhere. So, each one of these will be an X, Y, Z rotation. So, to do X rotation, you would do this one. The Y rotation, you would then do this one, uh, feeding one into the next. So it rotates bit, then rotates bit, then rotates bit. It's just all kind of cumulative. It, it's, it's it's quite straightforward. It's just, you know, you do a cos with the angle, same with the angle, multiply it by the coordinates, and you get your answer. So it's pretty simple. Now, the magic bit was this, doing perspective. Um, it's black magic. Who knows? Oh, there's the pi up there, angle by X. Angle about Z. So there you go. That's where I got that from, and that told me what was what each of these pies is. There's presumably there's a theta in there as well somewhere. I'm not seeing it, but I'm sure, it, I'm sure it's there somewhere. So the um, perspective effectively is um, dividing through by Z. That's the magic that makes it kind of get smaller in the distance. Um, there are maths papers on it if you really want to understand it. I have no idea how it works. It just kind of does. That's all you really need to know. Um, you take your x, y, z, you transform them. You take your z and then you divide x and y by the z and things get smaller in the distance. 
it's magic. But you don't really need to care why it's magic, it just does. So, taking those rotations that we saw um, here, let me just bring them up again so we can get them. Let me just move that over here a wee bit. Alright, so. That's better on this side. There's the, um, you know, cost stuff that what angles are. So this is um, a Y rotation. Okay, so one of these, you know, cost sign, blah, 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 blah. It's basically doing exactly the same that and sticking it into a matrix form. Um, now, although this is a 3x3, three 4x4 three, four four is just another row, column, um, with the one down at the bottom. And that's, that's basically all it is. So you take your angles, your uh, rotation, I used to call it heading and pan a lot of the time because it was for you know, movement, you would kind of do heading, pan, pitch and rolls and stuff like that. Um, so you do your Y for whatever is on the Y axis. Now the Y axis is the vertical one. So if you're rotating about that, it's going to spin about that axis. So that's 0, 360. So you do cos, sine, sine, cos. You see these are the same, you just stick them into this position in the matrix. Now you could multiply that to the vertex afterwards, um, which we will do later, um, and then you would get just the rotation on that point. Um, however, what I do then is, well what you, you tend to do you can is you'll then do an X, X one as well. Um, kind of going from angle and exactly the same this is x rotation just put them into different positions now matrix multiplies uh, you can look at any um maths book from high school but how you do it matrix by matrix multiply just kind of row by column multiplies again no idea how matrix multiply actually does its magic you just apply a row by column multiply and it comes out when you do that to the previous one this is what you get so this is down here this is a y rotation times an x rotation matrix this is what you get we'll ignore this for the moment now that's i sat oh years ago now um probably in about 1986 or so 86 87 i worked this out and i've just kept it um, I basically sat down with the two matrices, multiplied them together, did all the different stages and wrote down what each stage was. And when you go to Z, again, things are in different places. I don't know why, they just are. Um, so you just do your sign courses, stick them in those positions in the matrix. And then when you multiply that to previous one, you get this, which is a more complicated one. But at the end of the day, it's just... You know, you take your cos h, cos r times this, blah, 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 blah. Stick that value in there. And then once you've done all this, you have effectively a 4x4 matrix that you can use to rotate things. Now this here, which comes from all this as well, is the model's x, y, z position in space. Okay? Now, for the most part, if you're dealing with a single object, that will just move it somewhere in space. Once you get to hierarchical objects, that is then relative from its parent. So if something rotates, the child will rotate with it, and that's an offset from the parent. It's basically an X, Y, Z in its local space. And for the first matrix, that's basically the world. Any subsequent ones from a parent or child or whatever, that's going to be local from that space. So you can see that's what we call unit matrix, which is just ones diagonally. If you have a 4x4, four four, there would be another one down here. Unit matrix or ID matrix. And then that's the positions of them, again, for 3x3. Three three. Okay? So, to do a normal rotation matrix, this is what we need to make. Um, going back through the steps, that's a single Y matrix. Then you would multiply a single X matrix into it. Then you would multiply a Z matrix in, into it. And that's the combined matrix. Now, the reason I don't use, I don't do them all as individual matrices 
is because a 4 by 4 matrix multiply is about 64 multiplies and adds for each one you do. So if you're doing three of them, then 64 times three, that's a lot of processing time. Whereas this is about 20 something, I think I worked it out as 22 or so, um, which is much, much faster. Uh, because a lot of it is zero. So you're multiplying zeros by zeros and adding zeros so you can get rid of a lot of it. So that's what I did here. I did it all by hand, put down three by three matrix, multiplied it by another three by three matrix and saw what all the, the values were going to be. Okay, so this is what we need to make. Now, the other part of doing any 3D is aside from making this and, and multiplying all your vertices by this, is you want to do something called a matrix stack. Now, you've heard me saying this times this times this. Now, what you do for, how you tend to do these is you tend to use a stack. You tend to get create this matrix, push it onto a stack. Now, if you've not done stacks, a stack is, um, you take this column here, okay? So, if I put a number in here, that would be the first entry on the stack. If I put another number on there, then that one would go up and that would be the base of the stack. So let's say this is, I'll just color this one here to be that. And then these could be, actually let's do it the other way because it would pretend to be this. Right, so this is the current stack pointer. And every time I push one up or push another one onto the stack, it does that, it kind of pushes up. And then when I pop it, it does that, everything comes back down again. And then I pop it again and I will get that, okay? So stacks are handy for storing stuff on and getting them off again. And the program encounter, the actual CPU uses stacks all the time for doing calls to, to functions. You're in a function, it calls something, so it pushes its current position off. Um, so you would have, it'd be something like this. If you're down here and you would call a function called draw, then it would push, um, oops, it, is it? it would push, see game if you're in the game you call draw it push game on the stack if draw called something like a pixel plotter then it would do something like that and then when it returned from the pixel that would come off and the game last address would fall off and so on so that's how the processor keeps track of where it is in its um, program so you, it would run a function it would call something it would call something else and each of the return parts of those get pushed onto the stack so that it can pop them off. So stacks are really handy in, in programming. Um, for us, we're going to use it for the matrix. So we'd end up doing Y rotation, stick that onto the stack. We then make an X rotation matrix and we put that onto the stack. However, matrix stack is slightly different in that when you push something onto the stack, it multiplies with the previous element. So you get this, which is good. So when we then make, oops, it is it? Hang on. Uh, so when we then add the Z rotation, let's make it a bit bigger. We then get that. So that's our matrix stack. Push that on when you push something else on it combines with whatever's there previously now if you wanted to do other calculations and preserve stuff you would set a unit matrix on top so that you get a push that's a push multiply or just a set that would push all those up put unit one on and so on all these would tend to be filled with like just unit matrices which is this thing here which is an effectively an empty matrix this one up here if you multiply anything by that you just get this back again so what we're going to create first is a matrix system with a matrix stack because that's invaluable to us doing things um, and creating hierarchical models. So the best hierarchical model you can think of is a tank. Tank's got the base, it's got the, the wheels that go around and it's got the turret that moves no matter how the tank goes, the turret kind of moves with it. That's always the best example of hierarchical models. So let's have a look at that. Right, so the first thing we're going to need to do is, let me just get my bearings, is create a matrix class, okay? And the matrix class will do basic things like store the matrix, multiply them together, 
um, we could use it for then doing creating projection matrices later on. Okay, so I'm going to make a new class called C matrix, and we're going to first of all put in a little bit of stuff that we. Oops. Now, you remember from the Excel thing, these, these are the locations. Now, these are really handy for accessing the different points of the matrix. Because effectively, we've just got going to have an, an array of floating point numbers. Um, now, we're doing four by four matrices. So we're going to have a 16 array. Um, and this gives us access to the basically the grid of stuff in there. And it helps us multiply stuff together. Um, next, what we're going to do is this is a bit of C sharpness to give us easy access to the actual array. Um, what this does is that when you create a new matrix, you can just access it with brackets like an array, and then we can use these to access the four by four within that. Instead of having a 2D array, we can just use these to access it. So it keeps it simple. Now, we need to make our, our um, matrix. So what this is creating um, is when this is nude, it creates a new float array of 16. They are all zero in C sharp. Whenever you knew something, the contents are always zero. So you don't have to go around mem setting stuff to zero all the time. So when we knew this, M is always full of zeros. So we're going to make the diagonals all ones. Now again, you remember from here, an ID matrix a unit matrix is always one. So again, four by four, be one, 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 one. That makes it an empty matrix. So no matter what you multiplied it with, it would always come out like uh, as as the original uh, thing. It doesn't doesn't impact any other matrix. Now, the next thing we need to do is actually do the matrix multiply. So again, this is why I'm not typing it. <laughs> it's got a lot of uh, just numbers and lookups, numbers and lookups. Now, like I say, you can look up um, how matrix multiplies work. It's basically when you multiply two matrices together, you take the column from one, the row from the other, and then that gives you the answer um, to one of the cells. So I'll leave this on here just briefly so that if you ever want to reference it, you can come back and pause. Um, I never work these out. Once I've done it once here, I cut and paste because it's always the same. Um, occasionally, if I'm doing like an assembler version or something, I'll have to go through and do it, but I never work out the row column, row column stuff. I just look at this and all the indexes refer to you know, the different points in the matrix. So you can see here to get this element in the destination, top left, we take the first um, column, because it's one by, um, one by one, one by two, one by three, one by four, and we multiply it by the first row. One by one, two by one, three by one, four by one, and then so on. They kind of go down um, and, and kind of keep working across and down and so on. Okay, again, this is in what would have been no grade math for me, but it's, um, I don't know what the hell maths are these days. You'll find it in a normal math book. Matrix multiplies are just magic. Basically, you multiply stuff together, stuff comes out. No idea how it works. But that lets us do our, our um, Y rotation times X rotation matrix. Okay, now we will add in... So I've got a really tickly nose for some reason. Uh, we will add in... Oops, not that. Just another multiply so that we can call it um, just slightly differently, but this just calls up to here, um, gets your matrix and returns it. That one wants a matrix passed in. This can, you can call that and you'll get a matrix out. So it's just a, a nicer way of calling it. Right. So that's the core of just doing the multiplies. Um, and we will now do the matrix stack. I don't know why that, oh, there we go. So, matrix stack is the kind of important bit in terms of combining things together. Um, 
and we use a C-sharp stack, which is, as I described before, just you push things on so it's the last thing on is the first thing off. Okay. Um, we've got some basic things of reset and create. Oops. So this is the constructor. This just makes a stack with a few pre-allocated elements on it. Um, just space for pushing stuff on. C sharp will expand it as need be. Um, and then when we do a reset, we clear it and we push on a unit matrix. Um, so the unit matrix is just that empty one that will mean that when we want to play anything else on or put something on, it's it'll be the first thing that goes on. It, it, it won't be affected by any rubbish that's on there before. Now, push matrix is where it starts getting interesting. So you take a matrix and if there's nothing on it, it just gets set there. If there is, then it starts doing the multiply. So we when we first push the Y matrix on, it would go through there, it would just store it, there's nothing there before. When we push the X on, it'll get the Y matrix, it'll multiply it with the X matrix, and then it'll push it. And that's the kind of magic of a matrix stack. It's just, it will multiply with whatever is on the stack um, there already. And then, being a stack, we need to have a pop to get rid of it, and a peak so that we can see what is the combined matrix on the top of the stack of all our working out. So if we were doing the matrix, matrix by matrix, we'd, we'd get the Y, we'd push it, we'd get the X, we'd push it, we'd get the Z, we'd push it. And that final one would be the combination one that we want to use to rotate things. So we'd then pick the matrix stack to get that combined one for us. And that way it's really easy. You don't have to kind of mess about. You just push the on, pop it off. It's nice and simple. So. First of all, let's see about making this um, this matrix stack. I'm not quite sure where I put the matrix stack stuff. Um, I ended up having a camera system, I seem to remember. Um, I'm just reminding myself. Is the matrix stack static, is it? No. Right, hang on a minute. I'm just trying to see where I used the matrix stack. Um, there. So I think this is sharp, which I love. Find all references. There we go. Okay. So it's in that battle zone thing. Right, so what I what I've done in here is I've made uh I was gonna be doing a battle zone game of this. Um so we'll just call it that because why not? Okay. Now, this would just be whatever game you're going to be working on, but for me, it's just Battlezone, so I can keep it the same. Because Battlezone is obviously wireframe, and one of my game in the days was going to be Battlezone. So this was going to be the framework for 3D, so that I didn't have to basically work out the 3D on um, on screen, because getting that initial thing on screen is always a nightmare. Okay. So. With this... Um, this is the software screen that we've created. So in that game, as I said, the, the framework creates a software screen here. Okay, so the Battlezone framework um, will take in stuff for drawing and rendering. Probably don't really need it, but it's easier. Keeps it a wee bit cleaner. Uh, so let's just... Battles on. Right. So, this is the byte array for the screen. Width, height, and then font, in just case we want to do any debug rendering. And for that, we need some variables. Okay. Now, matrix stack is just a new matrix stack. Oops. There we go. And then from then on, we can create matrices, we can push them on. Nice and easy. Now, what we're needing to do after this is actually, if you remember from here, 
we want to there's another step which I'll go over in a minute we want to make these as our matrix so that we can then transform things okay now there is another step which is scale so if you think of a, a cube like what we call a unit cube which is one by one by one okay it's used in debugging a lot and you'll tend to scale it to whatever size you want to put around things so how do you scale it well that can be in the matrix so these will normally be one um, and that would keep it as a one to one or you can put in two three four and that would scale it by that amount and again I just worked out the matrix that times this which would be on the matrix stack and that gives me this you can see it's just multiplied through on each of these columns and that scales up things okay so we're going to make a function that creates this for us interestingly this is also the function that's in game maker when you do create matrix so let's go just I'm going to cut and paste this because it's going to avoid any errors. Here we go. Right, so this basically makes that matrix we were looking at. You can see here different things. Now there's lots of common elements in this. So you've got cos H, which is here, here, cos P, there, there, um, and so on. I mean, in sign p there's a negative one so you create you would do a sign that and then negate it and so on so back in the day when we were on software we had not a lot of processing time then getting all the common elements doing it once so you didn't keep doing sign this sign that cost this cost that um was a big benefit so that's what we do here cost signs blah 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 and then it just keeps them all common and then they are used down here so that keeps the sign courses uh, lookups to a minimum, which is always good practice. Yeah. Um, and then this is uh, all the values that go in. So I've got X rotation, Y rotation, Z, scale, and then the translate. You can see it's not terribly complicated. You just have to know where everything plugs in and how it multiplies together. And like I say, I just use this all the time. Um, that's how I work things out. Once I've done it once, I just copy and paste because it's always the same. Um, this is the final one. I think in this one I do have different explanations of it. I've never actually gone through this. You can do shears and stuff. So you can do isometric matrices and stuff, but I've, I'm not really sure how they work. I don't really, I've never really done one. When we did have an isometric game at DMA, somebody else figured out the matrix for us. And they did that by fiddling until it worked. So, but this is pretty much all you need to know. The different sign courses based on how these multiply together. That times that gives this. This times that gives this. This times that gives this. And then lastly, this times this gives our final matrix. And as I say, you could push all those onto the stack, but that would be three different sets of matrix multiplies which would be very expensive compared to this which isn't very much at all okay so we have our create matrix and we have our matrix stack um so how what are we going to do now um that's a good question so what we should really do is start thinking about a camera now it's all very well to have something spinning about in 3D space, but unless you've got a viewpoint, it makes no difference what you've got there. So we're going to make ourselves a camera system. And so. Uh, the width height will be the screen because that's important for how things scale um, to your viewpoint. Um, direction vector. Don't think I ever got around to using them. Um, the idea for these is so the camera's got a direction. So if you want to move the camera in that direction, you could just add these on, but I never quite got around to using them. So we'll take them away for the moment because that'll just confuse things. Um, so this is the camera's rotation and the camera's position in space. 
So if we've got a cube here, let me just get my thing up so I can see. If we've got a cube here and then a camera here, you know, it can be pointing the wrong way. So you need to point it at the object so that you can see it. Part of the problem with getting any 3D engine started is you could have some object here and you could be like pointing the wrong way, you could be inside the object, you could be, um, the object could be behind you, and it could just not be rendering, and it's always a pain to get that first. Right, everything's rendering now, let's, uh, let's start drawing things, but that first one is always a pain in the bum. Okay, now we're going to do two important parts to this, um, this camera. We're going to zero everything off, that's just an initial value that will put the camera behind me for, for now. And then we need to have two new matrices, which haven't been written yet. So, well, the view matrix is just a matrix. You will notice they're all negative, because a camera matrix is the reverse of all your rotation matrices. Um, it's just the way it kind of works. Um, it's an inverse matrix, effectively. Um, but the easy way to do that is just the different angles you've got, you just negate them and create a matrix with it. And you're good to go. Same with uh, positions. They're just all negative. Um, and that's fine. Now the projection matrix is definitely a piece of black magic. Um, I'm going to copy one over and I'll briefly go over it, but I have no idea how they work. Not really. Okay. This is again another one that's a pain in the bum to get going. Um, it is documented on lots of math sites if you want to go through it, but it's just, you know, somebody's worked it out. They've, you know, the early uh, computer graphics guys all worked these out, and everybody else just kind of uses them. So you can see up here how it arranges in that four by four matrix. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And this is the different things you've got in it. So. Let's go through the different parts we've got. We've got FOV, which is the field of view. That's the angle that, um, how much do you see basically in your 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 view? So if you've got um, a, a 90 degree view, it could be like this. If you've got 120, it'll be slightly wider. And that's how much you're gonna squeeze into that, that view. Aspect is the aspect ratio. Um, if you're using a square screen, it'll be one to one. If you're using a widescreen, you'll get that 16 to 9 kind of ratio. Um, and it's just a, basically a value that will then be divided through everything to make everything come out the right aspect instead of being stretched or pulled or something like that. And then you've got ZN and ZF, which are the near and far planes. The near plane is going to be a kind of one. The far plane could be like a thousand. And that's how much of your... Uh, space you're going to fit into your projection. So if you've got a model that's 2,000 away, it's going to be out the back and, and beyond the field of view. Um, and that's basically the, the parts that we, we work with. And it's not particularly complicated. So you can see from here, um, we've got a 120 uh, field of view. That's my aspect ratio. Ignore the times one, that was part of the fiddling. Um, and then I've got my near and far. Let's take away the times one because I don't need them. And that's just confusing things. So 120 degree field of view, aspect ratio of width times height. So if it's square, it's going to be one. If it's not, it'll be whatever the width times height is. And then my near plane is one and my far plane is a thousand in Z. Okay, so that kind of gives me my, my box. It's about a thousand by 120 degrees, whatever that is. Okay, and that makes my camera matrix. So I'll leave that on there for a minute so you can kind of see. And again, it's, it's a lot of the things in maths, in 3D maths is just somebody else has worked it out. You don't really need to understand it. You just need to be able to produce the code that makes, you know, this kind of matrix so you can multiply it in. Okay. Are we understanding so far, or have you all gone to sleep? <laughs> I wouldn't blame you. So, let's just get the rest of this up now. Okay. All right, so now that we've got 
a camera and a camera system and a matrix we can do a new camera that gets passed in with high oh, camera what's uh, game and then these are all going to be the wrong thing okay and so whenever you make a new thing it does it it makes the name stuff inside that and it just gets a bit confusing so why are you not fine oh i've not created a camera yet so that's going to be up here right so now we need to create one of these so we can kind of get going so that's going to be in game let's actually start doing some stuff yeah no, so i must have another one somewhere Hang on. Less accessible, so it's got public beside it. There we go. Uh, oh, that's still got a game on it, which is why the game is complaining. Okay, so that should be battle zone and then battle. Okay, so this is part of the framework, it creates a it does its thing. We will just add in at the end of this a create. So that takes the new screen array uh, with the width and height, passes that in, and it also passes in the font in case we want to do any rendering. Now we do have a battle in net, which we've not written yet, which will. It's really just part of the process that I do for any, any module that I attach. Um, Everything that's going to be a process in a game, I do a an net quit render. Let's look at the void. Okay, that's my standard module. I, really, I should have a a base class that does that because I always use it. Um, and that way when you you could have some kind of system that you know you create one through and it knows how to call stuff and and when to call um okay so render and then game so that means now we want to do battle quit quitter No, not quite. Quit. Um, battle dot process. And where did I put my battle dot render? All right. So we're going to get rid of some of this because these are all the um, debug lines and fills that are just part of the framework, which we don't need. Uh, I don't want that. And. I'll comment one of these out and get rid of the other ones and I don't really need the buttons. So we'll get rid of that as well. Okay. Now this, basically our software screen goes through and clears every frame. Just nice and simple. So does this actually build? Should be an empty screen. There we go, empty screen. Right, so we're now kind of good to actually start getting a bit further um, what I'm going to make is something called a render context now this is just something else so I can hand around that has the screen in it and um, cameras and matrix stack all that kind of stuff it just keeps it a little bit simpler for passing things in that need it for when we start transforming stuff uh, later on so what that's gonna have in it is this so matrix stack camera and then screen information um, and that should be all we need for something else to render to the screen okay um, now that is made from the battle zone and here 
we need one up here. Okay. So we create around the context, we put the screen information in and the new matrix stack and the new camera. So now we've got something that has all the information that we kind of need. Okay. Now we're going to start getting a bit more interesting. So a new thing called model. And this is where it gets interesting because we're going to start doing um, some transformations. Um, class C model CS. Okay. Public. I don't want that. All right. Now, within each model, we will ignore this for the moment. Oh, that should be C model. So we'll ignore the children for the moment. So for each model that we've got, we've got a stack of vertices and lines. Now the vertices are just all the different points and edge connections and all that kind of stuff in 3D space. And the lines are a list of points that we will draw between to make anything. So if you think of a cube, you're going to have eight vertices and then four, eight, six, twelve lines. Is that right? One, two, three, four, one, three, four, one, four, twelve lines. Um, which are just pairs, 12 pairs of, of indices into the vertex pool. We then have X, Y, Z, position of it in 3D space, um, rotation for it, and scale. Um, that's just a pool I don't care about. And I think that's, isn't that just a dirty... Yeah, we, just, we just work out to keep it. So that'll be the matrix of this. Um, once we get into that. So, what we're going to do first is, actually we've got a, a constructor. Yes we do. So, C sharp, do a constructor, set the scale to one so it's not zero. Remember, C sharp initializes everything to zero. Um, so we initialize it all to one for the scale. That keeps it the same. Don't do that. And we don't do that just now either. There we go. Now, do a little bit of magic stuff here with that. We'll get back to this in a minute in case you haven't done these things. Um, and we will do the update first. So, the update basically takes all these values and makes the matrix. So it goes through our new matrix system, creates the XYZ rotation angle position and will generate us a matrix for this model. Nothing complicated. Um, now we get into the render. So I'm going to do this in little bits because that's where it gets complicated. Okay. So you'll see this takes a context because it, it wants to draw itself. Uh, we need to update the matrix before we draw. So if the main process had moved it or rotated it, then we'll get a new matrix stack. So it kind of, you know, if it's dirty, we always get a new one. Um, and then we need, well, they'd be set later, the points. So let's get um, our first model that uses this stuff, which is going to be a cube. Okay, so... Just going to do this. Right. Now, again, if you're not used C sharp, this is inheritance. So C cube is based off of the model. So we get all the functions and, and variables from the model, and then we add our own. So this is just points in 3D space that make up a cube. So again, there should be eight of these. So four, eight, and then we have zeros just to terminate. Um, I well, technically we could be using that, but I think it just loops through. And then cube lines. Now, I said it was pairs. I did actually, when I was doing this, um, add in a line color, just 
it means you can highlight specific lines if you wanted. It was just a bit easier. Um, now, each of these refers to a coordinate. So 0 and 1 refers to this. It will draw a line between 0 and 1. 1 and 2, draw a line between 1 and 2, 2 and 3. So that's creating a kind of you know square on top. And then it starts kind of going down just doing all the other lines. So that's a, the cube and all the lines for the cube. So now we need a constructor. So remember the, the cube and lines are these things from the model that we've inherited. So when we create a cube, we set the verts and lines to be these ones. And then we set the y position to be a wee bit further away so we can see it. Um, we don't have any processing for this, so we're just going to do nothing. You'd probably do rotation here. Um, if you were processing it, if you imagine um, the cube was maybe being fired from a spaceship, you might give it velocity, you'd have it spinning into the distance, and then you might do some collision checking in that process tick. But for now, nothing there. So, now what we want to do is in our battle zone, um, we'll now create a new cube. So that's going to be um, cube up here. So we need a new cube. Oops. All right. And that means this has gotten this again. There we go. Okay. So we've created a cube. We'll not give it a big scale just now. Um, and then we'll see. And that goes. So we're now going to start on the render. So this is going to be our render. Now we obviously don't have these functions, so we don't know that for the moment. So in camera we're going to need a set. Okay. So just now we've just got the constructing. So we need a set. This is basically again just does an update, then uses the matrix stack. So we take the current rotational uh, values. So again, we could be moving the camera in the process or whatever. The reason you've gone for C Sharp as opposed to C++ for OpenGL. Um, I prefer C Sharp. C Sharp's a lovely language. C++ is a pain in the arse. Um, I mean, Unity's all C Sharp these days as well. I've, I have found in general, C Sharp you develop much quicker for because it's managed. You don't have to worry about memory leaks or anything. If there's no reference to it, the stuff just, it's automatically freed. Um, things like lists and stacks are so much nicer to use in C-sharp. Um, once you get into it, there's a whole lot of stuff to do with things like reflection, where you could find out, discover things about classes and do plugins. It, it's a very complicated language um, that you can get some really cool stuff from. So wherever I can, I will use C-sharp as my programming language. So it made sense just to do a kind of an OpenGL framework from C Sharp. This is in no way a, a, a you know a commercial game engine thing. This is for me playing, just to give me some triangles to render, a shader, maybe a software screen just to mess about in. It's certainly not like a production thing. It's just a toy. So C Sharp is is fine for that. Uh, C Sharp and OpenGL combo is fine for that, so it's much easier. Okay. Um, where are we? Right, so we get the latest values from the XYZ rotation position and we make the new view matrix. We then push the projection, then the view onto the stack. Now, the thing about rendering a matrix stacks is order is important when you push stuff onto the stack. If you push XYZ rotation or a ZYX, you will get a different result. So the projection has to go faster than the view. That's because the projection is the kind of final stage. Um, so it's the important, those parts are the important. How you combine your XYZ rotations for the model is up to you. Um, the one that I've pre-cooked is obviously um, the one that I've always used. It's, it's always been best. Um, so doing the update, Push projection, push matrix. 
Okay. Um, and now we need a cube render. Which cube? Which we don't have yet. So it isn't there isn't a cube render. There is a model render. Now the model render take, updates its own matrix and pushes its matrix onto the stack. So you remember we have the projection matrix that was multiplied by the view matrix and now we're about to multiply in our own matrix which is in turn uh, an XYZ matrix that have all been combined. So they all get pushed onto the stack and then we can pick the stack to get the matrix we're about to render with. So that's matrix there. Now we get into the interesting part where we go transform. A model so we'll go through this um, okay we'll do this in bits now that's oh, because it wants to return okay now we get the current stack combination of everything and we will then do a transform on the array of vertices that have been passed in. This is going to be a matrix transform and this is the kind of guts of how to do the 3D part really. Uh, matrix. So we're just going to stick this down, down the bottom. Uh, yeah, down here. Right. Now, this is the core of it. Now, when you multiply a 4 by 4 to a 3 vert, three vert position, um, again, this is how it's multiplied. So you take the uh, column times x, the next column times y and then the next column times z and then you add on the very last column which is your x y z position in space okay so this was from it's kind of the same as the um as this stuff you know it kind of feeds back in and feeds back in and feeds back in and then you get the value out um so these are just in positions in the matrix, but it's still doing the same work. They all kind of feed back in each other and then you get a final projection out. So once you pass this through the matrix, so that multiplies all the X's. So we'll take the X coordinates. This is making a new X coordinate. It takes first column, the top left of the matrix times X, um, the next element down in the matrix times y, the next one down after that times z, and then adds on the uh, x position, and that gets stored in the x. And then it does the same for y, and the same for z. And then all it's doing is looping over all the different verts. So we pass an array of verts, and that's three elements to each vertex. Uh, so we get the length, divided by 3 to get the number of vertices, and then we just loop over them all. And hey presto, it transforms and makes this new array that we pass out. So, again, this is the kind of magic. You do the matrix, you apply this, and then the point is transformed in 3D space. And you get that out at the end, the array out at the end. Okay. So it is a little bit of, there's a lot of black magic in, um, in these things in terms of maths and in terms of what you need to un actually understand compared to um, what you can just use. So, uh, where we go, transform, okay. All right, so the next part we need to do is to get the, the context. Now, this is just doing a divide by two 
um, a shift right is a divide by two for each each point you've taken down. If I shift right two, then that'd be dividing by four. Shift right three, dividing by eight. It's all binary stuff. Um, so you could do that if you want. Exactly the same. Okay. Now that is important because we're now about to go and apply perspective and clip scaling. Now we'll explain the clipping. So if you remember the matrix that we created for projection here, what this actually does is it takes all your transform points and puts it into a zero to one space or a minus one to one space. So if you imagine a cube um, with zero zero at its center okay um, and then you have plus one minus one in all directions all the transform puts it into the space now the reason it does that is because it's then very easy to clip and it's for the hardware and software as well um, but it's also easy to then scale into any screen space or um, anything else you need to do about it. So all your massive world space, you know, you could be thousands across. When you transform into your uh, camera space, it goes in, the camera looks at it and it's all squished down into this one by one by one space. Now, to, for that, we need to untransform that out of that space into the, basically what the screen is. So that's where this comes in. We've got width and height, so we need to scale these back up again. Before we do that, we need to apply perspective. Now, let's just take a look at this thing again, this magic here. So you can see here that it's not quite the same as, as what we do now, but it's, the core of it is, um, is basically dividing by Z when you take all this out it's doing 256 because it's doing a lot of fixed point stuff uh, and keeping things in scale but effectively this it's the same as it always was you're going to divide by z so you get the z coordinate out of your transform you do a one over it but just so we can multiply instead of divide because divide's slower we could just do divide by that value each each of these um, but you do a one over that and then you can multiply one overs um is basically tra changes it from a, a divide to a multiply so if we did this it's exactly the same basically divide my z divide my z right, let's leave it like that for the moment and then we can see okay so this does our perspective that's the magic bit that makes it all squishy and, and go small in the distance okay um we're still in clip space, so we're still in that zero to one kind of space for things, um, with zero zero being in the middle. So, what we need to do is just offset and scale by that space. Um, let's see, so that would be moving because the screen starts at zero zero at the top left, we add on one and then we add on half the width and height. And that kind of recenters things and, and positions it within that space. So as long as you remember that clip space isn't the transform, isn't the world space. It's all kind of a zero to one space. Then after you've got the perspective of it, then it's just a matter of moving things and scaling them up so they all kind of fit again. Okay. There are various diagrams of these in um, magazines and stuff, but they, they never particularly. Um, enlightening so right so let's go back to the model and our render okay so now that we've got a transform we're going to draw them okay so this is a bit of debug if the lines haven't been set it won't try and index it and crash so you remember that lines was the index into the, the vertices so you got two indexes and then a color so that's just reading these out okay 
We then read out the first vertex, which is this, nothing one, two, so that's x, y, z, x, y, z for the second point. Take these away just now, that's just confusing things for the moment. Basically to do thick lines, I just move them up a bit and make them a bit thicker, but we'll get to that. And then now that we've got that point, we're going to draw it in theory. Okay, so gets the two point transform points to draw between, gets the colour, reads the transform points out because we got that back from the transform there, gets the two points and then just draws a line between them and that should be it. I don't know what this is going to give us, it might even crash. Ooh, there you go. So we've got a cube on screen doing our transformy doodas. Okay. Now that's using the software draw, line draw that I, that, like I, say, I used before. Um, so what we really want to do now is rotate it. So that's going to be x rot, is it x rot? Rot x, okay. Rot x, um, point two, no. Oh. They're all floating point rather than doubles. Do y and we'll do z of 4. So it's a bit quicker. Now, I don't think I'm actually calling this, am I? So I kind of need to call the processing on that. Um, yeah, I haven't actually got... Actually, let's just copy this one instead. Do in battles on we can do cube dot process. Okay, what's that going to do? And there you go. We have a cube spinning away. So, little recap. We will do more on this just so we go a bit more deeper because I want to go over hierarchical models because that's that's the extension that kind of starts making sense for a lot of things like bone animation and character animation and all this kind of stuff. So what we've got is we've got a camera 3D space pointing at a cube that's got XYZ rotation stuff that we are spinning and then we draw it. We transform it then we draw it. Okay so is everybody following so far or are you bleeding from the ears? Let's just take a moment to just recap. Okay, so a matrix is an array of 16 floats, but it's basically a four by four uh, array of floats accessed with these. A diagonal matrix of one, 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 one for four by four is what's called a unit matrix. And it has no effect if you multiply it to another matrix. Our rotational matrix is a combined combined matrix of x, y, and z, or y, x, z to be more precise, and a scale. So we can scale things up if we want. So if that cube is too small, we can apply a scale and it will all magically get bigger. Okay. Now these are just going through a normal matrix multiply, which is column times row for each cell, just works out which new one it is and all magically comes out. Again, any um, third year maths book will tell you this and how to do it. Um, but you could just copy that function and then use it forever because it's exactly the same. It will never change. Okay, so this is what we use to create a matrix for the model. You just plug in the different rotations. So again here, each a cos h is the cos of the heading or the y rotation, sine of the y, minus sine, so on, plugged into um, this on a 4 by 4 I'm not sure why that's highlight. Oh, because that's wider for some reason. Okay. Um, yeah. So you just plug them into the right point. 
in here and you will magically get a matrix that works. Okay, so that is this function. So it works out all the common stuff. There's a couple of commons where those are multiplied, so work goes out as well. And then for each entry of the matrix that we need to update, we multiply them together. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, eight, and one. I should have 22. I must have missed one. 22 multiplies and several adds. Compare that to 64 multiplies and adds per matrix as you combine them. So this is obviously much quicker because a lot of them cancel out when it's 0 times 0. So you don't have to do them. Okay. But it's basically this function is what you need to make a 3D matrix. Okay. So I'll pause this here. You can take a, you know, a copy this into your own stuff if you want. Um, I've used this for gee, um, 25 years now. It, it works fine. Um, sometimes you might need to change the order of the matrix and that might get, you'd have to go and work it out again. I've never needed to do that. So rotation x, y, z, scale x, y, z, translate, that's where it is in the world. Okay, so I hope you're all following. So, there's the matrix multiply, row column multiply, again, just copy it, it's it's never going to change. Uh, the order you'd multiply stuff in will be different, or is, is important, so if you put them in and it's not quite right, swap them around to see if that magically fixes it, because um, it does make a difference. And one of those things about getting a 3D engine to work is sometimes you've put in this times that and it should have been that times this. Um, it's just one of those things. So again, the mass is it's pretty simple. Just copy those. It will magically work. And the matrix stack is again very simple. It's just a normal stack where you first in, first out. Um, as you push them, the only difference with this compared to a normal stack is that it will multiply. So it will multiply to the last element on the stack and you can use that for all manner of things. Uh, for our case, we're just doing a straight, stick it on the stack, multiply it, multiply it, and then get, when we come to render, we get the top of the stack, which is the one that's been multiplied with everything, and we use that to transform the, the points. The transforming of the points is um, row times x, next row times y, next row times z, add on the x, y, z, translation, world translation into space. And that's, that's it. You just look over all the points doing this. And again, that's basically what the magazine from 1993, 1983, 1983 is doing. It's just applying that through. It's not doing it as a matrix, it's just doing it directly. Now, I used to do this even when I started doing 3D graphics on the PC and the reason for moving to matrices instead of doing this um, is kind of twofold really. Uh, first of all, modern hardware with vector units and shaders really likes to do things as a four multiply. You can do four multiplies in one go. So doing a matrix is very, very quick in modern hardware. Um, the other thing, the other reason for doing it as matrices is that matrix stack. So hierarchical models just fall out of how the matrix stack works. So let's do the hierarchical model and then you'll see what I mean. So let's put the children back in and let's just do that, the render for children. Okay, so we've got this here, we'll get back to this later. Um, da, da, da. Now, children. So, what this does is this calls itself. So it's recursive. What that means is if you have a child, um, 
you've got your cube and the cube has a child and then it could have a child and it could have a child and it could have a child and it will just call down and call down each time to each child and transform and render. So it just keeps going until there's none left and then it'll pop back off and come back again. You remember what I said about stacks in the processor? Um, every time it goes in it just pushes itself, push, 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 push and then it'll pop off and it will come back to this point and carry on. So children are um it's inherited the rotation now you get children and you get siblings so a sibling is something that's on the same level it doesn't take your matrix um it would take the parents matrix but not your matrix so imagine the tank tr again you've got a tank with the tank tracks now the tracks would be a sibling of the body but you would need to have a parent that had the orientation of the the tank as a whole as it kind of moved like that the, the tracks would kind of move with it but you know if the body moved suddenly for whatever reason then the, the would the, ta the track be a no, the track would be a, a child because it would move with it, dep <laughs> it depends are you going if you're going to do physics with tank tracks then you know it's going to move the body rather than body move the, the tracks it would get complicated um but let's see everything in a tank is effectively a child really um so let's say you had something sitting on the body like um a gun that just sits there or a t you know spares a, um, a gas can and so on like that they would all be a child of the body but they wouldn't be children of the different gas cans that are on there if you've got four gas cans on it they would just be lined up in a in a row so each would be a child of the um it should be a child of the body of the tank but a sibling to the other gas can so they wouldn't inherit the other gas cans they would just be in the same position and, and we'd inherit from its its parent instead so these things are stuff that you should kind of play with because it's quite straightforward to to play with and see um the difference so what we're going to do is we're going to make a new cube Okay, I'm going to cube two. And we're going to make this a sibling of the other cube. To do that, we're going to have to move it out a little bit. Um, two. And I can't remember the other one, so we're going to clear the other ones. Now, because these positions are... That's my OCD kicking in. There we go because these positions are relative to um its local space in the real world its local space would be zero 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 in the, the the real world so again it's relative if you move it 10 10 it goes into the distance um if we left it at zero zero then wherever the first parent is the cube the other cube would be over the top and it would just be kind of moving like that so if we move it out by one then wherever the main cube moves, this will follow it, like one above it. That's the plan. So let's just do that. And then we've got to attach it. To the child. To the parent. Oh, and there we go. So what have I missed? That's not created yet. Okay. Oh, first crash. Uh, no, it's going to be in here right so we've not created the children yet right so there we go now you can see as it rotates this just follows it because it's offset from the parent without it just has a position so as the the, the parent's axis rotates then the child that just has a zero minus two position it starts off like this that's minus two up then it's to the local axis so as it moves it follows it along because that's the child's y axis is rotating with it okay so again that means when you're doing things like a tank you've got the tank and then the turret sits on top so as that moves the turret just follows it with it and it's just a natural part of this matrix stack it just goes in, it pushes the stack and carries on. So if we look at the render, 
you'll see here all it does is it pushes the current matrix onto the stack. Now, before it called here, we had the transform on there and we had the um, perspective matrix, then the view matrix, which is the camera, then the cubes transform, and then the child's transform combines onto that as well. Um, and so it just kind of offset from all the previous matrices before. And you can keep going with that as, as much as you want. So let's go back to battle zone and we'll, we'll move that down a wee bit because it was actually quite far away. Um, and we'll just keep it as a... It's still quite far away. I'm going to scale these up a little bit just so I can see which one's which. There we go. Let's scale both of them. Oh, because... I was doing the wrong one. There we go. I will now need to move it out further because it's now twice the size. Okay. So there you go. I might actually be better doing the other one, that to be honest. So we've got a small cube sitting on a large one. Um, I might only have to move it one. Yeah, XYZ one. Two. Uh, is inheriting the scale as well from its parent because it's a fully com oops, it's a fully combined matrix. Oh, I need to there you go. So I'll probably get away with one there. There we go. So we've got the big we've got the big parent cube and a child cube off of that. So let's then make another one okay three um, and that will go on with two now that's obviously going to be down there so Point zero. Okay, so there we can see that um, the parent rotates, we then have a child above that and then another child above that. Now, if we start to rotate this child, this one would move as well because it's a child. It inherits everything from it. So let's just go into here and do cube two. X equals zero. Actually, let's, let's make it a bit quicker just to differentiate to Y. Okay. So there you go. Because that child rotates, the other one rotates as well. So it all inherits these things. And that just comes from the matrix stack. You're not doing anything particularly complicated with it. And yes, it can it's a bit difficult to see with wireframe sometimes because it gets inside out and all that kind of stuff. Um obviously this is the big one. So the child one is moving relative to the big one at center point, and then it has a rotation about its own axis. And then the other one just follows along. Let's put one more in just for well, not clarity, just because why not? Two, four. But this time, let's offset it from there. Four, three, four. There we go. Now we've got an L. And again, it's because the first child rotates, all the others rotate from it. And they're all children. They could have their own rotations and, and everything else. Okay. You all following this? Oh, I'll definitely put you to sleep now. Okay. So that's, that's the basic rotation. So let's just scale up. Oh, it's not too bad actually because it'd be a bit bigger. So let's just go to the model render. All right. 
Um, I might just scale that up a little bit actually, just cause be easier to see. Right, okay. I'm going to stop the other one spinning. So, there you go. Oops. So, you can see there, it's stuck to this top part here, and then again inherit, so everything just follows. Um, we could be rotating this end one around the axis and it would all be fine. Ah, oh, zero, that's, that was the extra line I had. Okay. Okay. So, again, you can imagine this is a tank, and then that's the turret, and then the barrel coming off the turret, it's all just inherited. Um, and it means you don't do anything particularly complicated to render. It, it really is just that little recursive thing that calls itself, um, calls the other object, it gets an updated matrix that's slightly offset, and it pushes it onto the stack. Um, actually, what you should be doing there is popping that off the stack at the end. Should be doing that. Otherwise, it's just going to keep accumulating. Oops. That's not what I thought. Oh, no, hang on. Do not after that. After that. It should just look the same. Yeah. Okay. So after each child, it kind of pops off. And a sibling, if you had siblings, it, you would have a sibling loop down, down here, basically. You, you, you would loop through. Um, although you can get, you, you could do it with children, because you would just put lots of children on the same level, not as a child. Um, let's do that, just so we can kind of see how that works. So let's put another cube in. And this one will go in in cube. Okay, um, but that's going to have to be this one because it's just offset from the main thing. Instead of x, oh, in fact, that's because the first one was offset by y, so we're going to offset by x. So that should give it a different direction. He says, hopefully. There you go. So, that's two sets of children attached to it. So you can kind of see it's just... Um, you push stuff out the stack, and then you can have other models that are in the same kind of space and orientation. So if you imagine that big one as like a space station, and then you could have stuff coming off, um, and you might have to dock with one or something, it's, it's fine. Yes, I was. Although they didn't do it for the design dock, I just removed that because they didn't want any hassle from them if and when they found it. Well, it was a video that they, they issued with uh, slapdowns. Okay. So let's make these a little bit thicker lines just to make it a wee bit fun. Um, so all this is doing is for each point I draw a line from here and here and here and here to the same point so it just makes it a chunkier line because we're on quite high res screens these days there you go so you get a better idea yeah nice thicker lines um meh. yeah it's fine okay now let's do what we're all here for because it's much more fun let's create Cobra. Okay, so you want to go here, you will get, let me just see if I can open this up. This is where I got this from. Okay, um, it's basically somebody's um, disassembled elite and they've dumped all the, the models and, and, and whatnot. I didn't find the space station though, I have to say, I was going to do the space station. But it shows you the different edges for, for faces and all the verts. So I basically just copied that out for vertices and then there's the lines. Um, I did make a cube. I'm not going to do that at the moment. I just want the cobra. 
So let's um, make a cobra. No, not CQ. Cobra. So I just need to make one. Okay. And that's going to add it in. Okay, and then... Because it's all inherited from the model class, it's all just the same. There we go, we've got a Cobra. So now we can change the process of the Cobra. I've got the process of the Cobra, so I'm not doing that yet. Oh, oh, because I took away the cube. That's a bit of uh, another cube dangling off the Cobra, I didn't bother. Right, so there we go. Spinny Elite Cobra. Now again, the Cobra was just the model. I, I got a list of the points and stuff off that site and it's got all the, the faces and stuff. So it was, it was fairly easy to... Um, um, it's fairly easy to just kind of plunk the model in. Now, from this, you could start doing filled polygons um, and, and back face colouring and all this kind of stuff or use hardware or whatever. Um, that tends to get a little bit easier because the hardware basically takes, you know, the, the three points of a, uh, of a triangle and then will draw stuff for you and clips it for you and everything else. Um, but the actual model stuff and the, the matrix stuff, that's all the stuff that remains on the CPU for doing processing because you need to then be able to do collision and all this kind of stuff. Um, but that's the basics. Now you've got there, you could do a wireframe game from this. Um, oh, I don't know what's running. It's, it's Sid Music, but I don't know exactly what it is at the moment. At the moment it's Sanction. Um, yeah, I don't know about Take Two. It's they've got more money than sense. So, hey, what can you do? Um, okay. So um, that's really about it. You know, in terms of how you build up a very basic rendering system. Um, if you want to do a game like the original mercenary that was all vector you know that's it um back in the day they would have had to cut some corners with stuff and you'd be doing fixed point maths for everything rather than floats but you know here you've got a few matrices you apply that matrix to a bunch of vertices and then the trick really is to go through that projection um and the you know in the render um where is it here? Which is divide by Z. Now, like I said before, divide tends to be a slow operation compared to multiply. So what we usually do is do a one over. So we do one divide and then two multiplies. Uh, doing a one over is the equivalent of taking a divide into a multiply space. It's like taking it over to the other side. And it's totally broken because I used the wrong variable. Yeah. If you imagine in in maths before you have two things on the equal sign you take it over the other side it swaps from the divide to multiply and that's the same thing we're doing the one over so but there you go um yeah so spinny elite stuff and some hierarchical things now like i say what you the the best thing to do hierarchical stuff is is tanks because they're always nicely hierarchical i was going to do a battle zone game um, as a game in a day, this was to let me get a framework for it. Because uh, once you've got this, it is just putting tanks in a 3D world and then driving about with a camera. Because uh, your, your camera was your viewpoint that you're shooting from. And you would just shoot cubes at a distance. I think it was cubes. Or pyramids. Can't remember. 
um, into the distance. And that would, you know, you would then collide with these things. Now, collision in 3D tends to be spheres because all you're doing is subtracting the center points and then adding the two radiuses together. And then if it's within that distance, then you've kind of hit. Um, so it's very simple. If you do hierarchical collision, so you would put spheres around each of these are the center points. So you would transform all the center points using the matrix. So you would get a kind of sphere moving around with it. Um, and then you would do collision to those things. So like I say, sphere to sphere collision is really simple. Um, without any transform, you just have two points in space. You subtract them and get the distance between it, you know, the square root in 3D. So just like um, the Pythagoras thing of x squared y squared, you just add the z squared, square root that, and then that gives you the length of that line in 3D, which should be less than the sum of the two uh, radiuses of the two spheres. If it's less than that, you've hit. If it's more than that, you're still distant. Um, one of the tricks to that is to not um, get the square root of it, just do everything squared. So, because square root is a slow process. So you do X, Y, Z thing, don't get the square root, but take the two radiuses, square them up and add them together, then you can compare as well and you'll know if anything's hit. So if a spaceship was to fire a sphere or a cube, you would just look for the kind of sphere to that radius, see if it hit and then you can blow up. It, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, um, is there any questions on this? Because um, otherwise, I'm not sure what else to go over. Like I say, it's pretty straightforward. Once you've got that matrix stack and once you've got the view and projection matrix kind of going, um, the gotchas are really the matrix stack pushing the matrices on in the right order. And then that kind of, um, you know, the, the perspective matrix. The, the fudge of it's not the fudge it's how it, that works of taking it into a cube of one by one space um once you know that then the, the transform out you know it's just that kind of scalar out again if you didn't do this it would probably be a tiny little thing at the top left doing nothing because it's zero to one space you can just see it up there um, now if i scaled that up take that out so that's just mod taking up from 0 to 1 to the width of the screen then it'll just be again top left spinning away because the origin in 3d space is here but on the screen your origins up here so you need to add on um, effectively half that now I could do that because that should be half Oh, so half the width and height there you go um, the plus one and zero plus one there is because it's in zero to one space I can add on one and that takes me to the center it's it's minus one to one so if you add on one you're moving it down to the middle but you can just as easily do that to move it halfway through the screen as well um, I just prefer this because it, it I'm thinking in clip space here. And then just that magic perspective divide. Um, hardware tends to, will do this for you, the perspective divide and the clip. So when you're passing stuff in to the hardware, you, you tend not to have to worry about this. You just put your projection matrix on and then it just magically comes out. Um, so, I mean, the next step for anybody doing stuff would really be to start using the hardware. And instead of doing lines, do polys. Um, and then you start getting into lighting, which is a normals stuff. And you start doing normals. Um, so let's just very quickly send some here. So if you've got a triangle like this, I'll be drawn, then a normal is a point there away from the face. So basically, um, you know, uh, if that's your poly side on, then your polys, your, your normal's like that, straight away from the face. Um, and then you transform the normal with the poly, 
and then you work out a light based on you know how the light's reflecting that kind of thing um how it's seeing it reacting to that and that's when you start getting the dot products and stuff like that that gives you like a cosine of an angle or something um but really when you do a dot product to it you get a zero to one and that's your light value that you then apply to whatever is on this triangle so if it's a, a red color then it would get lighter or darker if it's a texture map then the text at the each position would get lighter or darker but i say that would be for a different thing that's that's beyond the kind of simple where am I in the world and how do I transform maths of things. Okay. Cool. Nobody's got any questions? I'll just wait for a wee minute to, to make sure. No bits you want going over. Um, It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. You just have to remember this matrix stuff. Like, that's the important bit. That's the important bit. And you don't have to know how that works. Um, and then that. You can do it yourself, or you can just copy that. Um, and then the multiply. You just copy that. And that's it. Okay, well, if there's no questions, then I will call it there. I don't know how long I've been going. It wasn't a particularly long one. Have I got a timer anywhere? Uh, one hour 47. Yeah, a couple hours. Um, yeah, so there we go. That's how you get spinny 3D wireframe thing on screen. Okay, okay. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, I will be back with uh, normal game in a day stuff at some point um, soon. Um, I think uh, one of my patrons had suggested Monty on the Run uh, as a remake. I will need to try and find the graphics to that um, before we do that. So I might do another game in between while I try and find the rip graphics from it. I don't want to sit and draw them. So. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll take it from there and, and just see which which one I end up doing next. Um, if you've got any suggestions, there is a list on my web page that you can go and have a look at um, and then just ping me on Twitter and suggest something. Um, or I'm on Discord as well, you can do that too. And we'll catch you next time. Bye.